Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest edition of Observation Point Live. I am your host, Chuck Hobbs, and I am very pleased this afternoon to bring uh, to each of you, my watchers and listeners, a very special individual, uh, none other than Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. Now, many of you may have noticed him last week if you tuned in and watched the funeral of civil rights icon, uh, Representative John Lewis. He was the officiant as he is the senior pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. He is a Morehouse man, and he has also done additional graduate work earning up to the PhD at Union Theological Seminary. And he is in the news hot and heavy now because of the fact that he is running uh, for the United States Senate from the state of Georgia. And should he prevail this fall, he will be the first Democrat uh, to hold such positions since Zell Miller in 2005. And so with that, I wanna welcome to the show uh, my brother and friend, Reverend Dr. Raphael Warnock. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Great to be here with you. Yes, Thanks sir. So glad, glad to see you. Dr. Warnock, let me get right to it. Uh, when I woke up this morning, uh, a chuckle uh, crossed my face because I saw that the major headlines was that the WNBA players across the country were wearing Vote Warnock shirts, uh, which I took to be a repudiation of the owner, of the co-owner of the Atlanta Dream, Kelly Loeffler, who is actually the United States Senator for Georgia that you will be facing uh, this November. What were your initial reactions when you saw the t-shirts uh, with the support coming from the WNBA players? So let me say how deeply honored I am uh, by the support uh, from these women uh, with the WNBA. Uh, they inspire me by their courage and their commitment to standing uh, for the things that really matter. Uh, we are at an inflection point in our country. Uh, they, like uh, people all across the country, were shocked and uh, hurt by the video that we witnessed of George Floyd uh, literally being lynched by those sworn to protect in broad daylight. And this is a part of, of course, a long, tragic uh, train of such events in this country for far too long. And so they stood up and they're standing up in a moment like this, uh, saying that black lives matter, uh, centering uh, the ways in which there are certain parts of our community that suffer and that we have to deal with the ongoing challenge around racism in this country. And so they embraced it, decided to use their platform as athletes in ways uh, that are meaningful uh, to, to center those who, who struggle and who are suffering, to call for justice, and they were literally attacked uh, by Kelly Leffler, who is the owner or co-owner of the Atlanta Dream. Uh, and so they stood up. Uh, they're making clear that while she owns the team, they do not. Uh, she, uh, she does not own them. She cannot silence their voices. Uh, and when I met with them the other day, I, I was just so impressed by their courage and their willingness to lay it all on the line and, and to say in this moment, we can make this country, uh, which is a great country, a far better country. And uh, they have endorsed my campaign. They are part of our movement. And I'm so very proud to stand with them. Yes, sir. And Dr. Warnock, toward that end, has it surprised you somewhat that uh, the slogan, Black Lives Matter, I have always taken it to have an implied to, T-O-O, at the end. I have never myself or seen anyone else who has considered that slogan to mean that blacks are better than any other race or that blacks black lives should matter more than any other race. Has it surprised you both as a pastor and as a political figure that there are so many Americans who tend to want to pretend as if this is somehow tantamount to a form of black supremacy when that has never been the aim? No, far from it. Uh, if you think about it, it, it's hard really to imagine a more modest, statement that one could make uh, about somebody's humanity than to say that they matter. I mean, there are a lot of things that matter. I mean, uh, when we think about this vast ecosystem that ties us all together, not just human beings, but, you know, honeybees matter. So I, I don't know how that someone says that, that saying Black Lives Matter uh, somehow uh, is an expression of, of, of Black supremacy, except that you're unwilling to see the ways in which we're still caught up in this ongoing struggle around racism. 
Uh, if your house is on fire and you call the fire department, you don't want them to spray every house on the street because all houses matter. Uh, you want them to focus on the one that's on fire. And uh, this is what we've been saying for, for years now. The good news is I think uh, there's a huge section of this country that sees it, that gets it. There is a multiracial coalition of conscience pouring out into American streets, standing on the right side of history at this critical moment uh, in our country. And I think as a result of it, we're going to see the kind of change that we need to see. And I'm just so deeply honored to be able to be a part of it, uh, to stand uh, for the things that I've always stood for and somehow to turn my passion uh, into legislation as a United States Senator from the state of Georgia. And speaking of which, uh, Dr. Warnock, uh, as I alluded to at the beginning, uh, the last Democrat, I believe, to hold such seat in the state of Georgia was uh, Zell Miller. And with respect to Georgia, as is the rest of the solid South, it's pretty much red meat, red states, uh, strongly Republican. With that in mind, uh, a lot of people don't realize that when they see Atlanta, when I tell people that I went to Morehouse College undergrad, I'm like, there's Atlanta and then there's Georgia, so to speak. All right. You have a black Mecca in Atlanta, but outside of Atlanta, you have well, I, uh, Confederate flags flying up and down I-75 and every other byway and passageway that you could drive through. I, I, How are I you going to address I, that? I hate to break this to you, Chuck. But you went to Morehouse a long time ago, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no you doubt. Get, you and I get old. Listen, Georgia uh, is 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 not the Georgia that uh, you remember when you were a student here at Morehouse College. Yes, we sir. are seeing and witnessing in real time uh, uh, the new South emerging. It is bold. It is much more inclusive. It is diverse. It is it is embracing that diversity, and we're seeing it uh, in uh, the electoral results already in this state. We saw historic uh, 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 election turnouts um, in 2016. Hillary Clinton flipped old uh, red uh, districts in this state. Uh, my friend. And our Spellman sister, Stacey Abrams, came in 2018, expanded on that victory. Uh, she came within 54,000 votes of winning out of 4 million votes. She would have been the governor. And that was after a whole lot of cheating on the other side, a whole lot of voter suppression and incompetence, quite frankly. And she came within 54, 55,000 votes of winning, about 1.4%. Since then, we've registered 750,000 new voters in this state. 49% of them are people of color. And I only mention that because in the South, sadly, um, race is still uh, the most likely predictor of political uh, affiliation. But we're building a vast multi-racial coalition uh, that's going to win this race. 45% uh, of those 750,000 new voters that have registered since the 2018 race are under 30. And so the South is changing. Georgia is at the tip of the spear. Uh, during the June 9th primary, there was a lot of attention on the tactics of voter suppression in the state, and they are real. We saw the long lines that made national attention, voters standing in line for hours and hours, uh, new machines that don't work or, or that didn't work in some cases. Uh, workers who don't know how to operate the, the new machines because those in charge didn't give them the training that they should have gotten. And in spite of all of that, and we're addressing it all, um, we saw record Democratic turnout in this past June 9th primary. More voters turned out than we saw uh, uh, during the 2008 election when uh, Barack Obama was seeking to make history. We had 1.3 million Democratic voters turn out uh, on the June 9th primary. The Republicans had less than a million. Uh, we outperformed them in the sixth congressional district where Lucy McBath uh, is running for re-election in a seat once held by Newt Gingrich when you were in college. Mm -hmm. And we flipped the seventh. Uh, uh, we're, we're getting ready to flip the seventh district. And uh, we outperformed them in Fayette County, something we haven't done in a generation. So the South is changing. Georgia is at the tip of the spear. 
We saw it in the primary. The other side knows that the momentum is with us. The wind is at our back. That's why they're engaged in voter suppression. People who think that the electorate is with them don't engage in voter suppression. But the other side knows that they're in trouble. And so rather than have the voters pick their elected officials, they're trying to rig the system so that the, the folks who want office, high office, are actually picking the voters. It won't prevail. Through vote by mail and other systems, uh, you're going to see a historic win uh, in November. And uh, I will be the next United States Senator from the great state of Georgia. And I'm speaking that into existence as well. And so when you are Senator from Georgia, uh, while I have you for a few more minutes, what ways do you believe that that chamber of Congress should go about trying to address uh, COVID-19? We all see the numbers. We recognize that this surge will probably stay uh, solid through the winter, uh, probably to the point when you're first sworn in. Uh, with that in mind, in what ways can the federal government best address to help businesses, individuals, schools return to some sense of normalcy? Sure, I'm glad you asked. And uh, listen, we've got to focus on the health of our of of our people, of the American people, the people of Georgia. And there are folks who are trying to have us embrace this false dichotomy that's gotten us in this mess between saving uh, people's lives and saving the economy. Well, the people are the economy. And certainly we all want to open the economy. We want to see our children go back to school like you. I have very small children. Uh, they're very bright and I, I want to see them get back into school. Uh, but we've got to do the things that are needed and necessary to open the economy uh, in a way that is safe. And we've got to protect the health of our, of our people, which is why I've always been uh, a strong champion of health care. I believe that health care is a human right. And it is certainly something that the richest, most powerful nation on earth uh, can and ought to provide for all of its citizens. Uh, that's why I got arrested in uh, a governor's office here a few years ago, arguing that Georgia ought to expand Medicaid. We'd left 400,000 Georgians in the Medicaid gap. Since then, that number is now 500,000 in the Medicaid gap. I'm running against a sitting United States Senator who's being challenged by another Republican, a sitting uh, uh, Republican Congressman. And both of them are standing with Donald Trump as he is again trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act, literally suing, uh, trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. That would leave 1.8 million Georgians uh, who have pre-existing conditions without coverage in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so we need someone to champion health care uh, for all times, but certainly at this time when we're dealing with a deadly virus that is highly contagious, uh, we need to make sure that everybody's covered. And we need to make sure that we give workers that we call essential, essential pay and essential benefits and the protections that they need in order to be able to work uh, safely. And uh, we ought to pass the legislation that is needed uh, so that states all across this country uh, can operate uh, a robust vote by mail campaign, uh, which the president is resisting at this very minute. People should not have to choose between saving their lives and saving their constitutional right to vote. I totally agree. And Dr. Warnock, I know that we have come close to time now. I want to thank you for allowing us uh, a few moments uh, to share with you to understand a little bit more about your campaign. And I am imploring all of my listeners and readers who live in Georgia to make sure that they vote for uh, Reverend Dr. Ra Raphael Warnock this November. And also, uh, is there a website that individuals who are not in Georgia can make sure that you secure the bag so that you can make sure that you're able to go forth and and put your vision uh, out there in the public square in September, October, heading on into November. I'm glad you asked. I, I'm a Baptist preacher, brother. You'd make a good deacon. It's time to raise an offer. <laughs> go to warnockforgeorgia.com. Everything spelled out, warnockforgeorgia.com. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors. Um, the folks, uh, the, the players at the WNBA are excited about our campaign. We've got endorsements all across the state. I'm grateful. And my parishioner uh, and brother whom I was honored uh, to, whose service I officiated this past week, John Lewis and, and all those who are part of the great cloud of witnesses are ushering us on into victory and in memory of those who gave so much and for the hope 
of the future of, of our children. Uh, we've got to make this happen. And indeed, we will. Amen, brother. God bless you and God speed. And I look forward to speaking to you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you for coming in and paying attention and patronizing Observation Point Live. Have a good day.